So this topic, I think, is is very interesting. Would you date yourself? <laughs> Already starting off with laughs, yes. <laughs> of course, of course, perfect, perfection. <laughs> Until you start thinking a little bit deeper about that, but yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so let's let's dive straight in because because I'm super excited to to hear this. Yay, let's dive in. Welcome everyone, our two people. I see Aaron and Sarah are still rocking with us. Um, good to see you again and educate some more. But yes, would you date yourself? Um, I can't tell you how many times, both professionally in a clinical setting and then personally within my support and friend life, um, I have individuals looking for their person and they've got their list and they have their um, check marks and things that the person has to have, what they have to possess, what they have to do, just a long laundry list of things. And the first thing I kind of follow up with, what follow up with is, do you possess these qualities within yourself? Are you able to provide everything of which you're looking for? And if so, why do you need partnership to fulfill that? And if not, why do you need partnership to fulfill that? And quickly the conversation turns left. I ruined the fun. I'm a party pooper. But honestly, this is kind of the idea set that a lot of people have to start moving towards. Um, Just as a humanity, we're evolving to more, you know, fast dating and more options and more ways to exist and show up individually in in, in relationships. So, you know, what we have to offer has to more so be embodied and presented within. And that also brings up the hard question that a lot of people don't think to answer. And if they do, don't even really want to process too much. And it's, if, do you love yourself? Do you have self-love? This is a safety, security, self-love event. So I'm glad we're ending with the self-love piece. But it you'd be surprised of how many people are struggling with that. So I'm here to say all the trigger words just to let you know of low self-worth, low value, you know, low, a lot of disrespect towards self. These are a lot of heavily charged things that people don't want to admit, but I'm here today to tell you that people struggle with. They may not admit it to you. They may not admit it in a relationship. They may not, you know, whatever, but from the therapist seat, (laughs) I wish more people would be honest about it so that we could just have more conversations about it and normalize it and get to the loving. So I've got my candle, I've got my journal. I should have worn that this is a very reflective, deep um, processing session. You know, we we just came from play and it was playful and great and I love that. But now it's time to kind of end with doing some deep dives into that. So if you have the journal, great. I didn't prep y'all for that, so it's okay. Do the little notes on your phone, grab a pen and paper because Um, As I said before, I'm a step person. There's six steps to lead to more self-love and compassion, which I think is really needed. So um, please raise your hand. Stop me um, if you have questions during all this, but it's um, apology is going to be a lot of processing. Um, So have your safe place either created or start, get that blanket. You know, we're we're here to do some work today. Um, So let me share this. So I can start. So would you date yourself? Dating and falling in love with self with me, Devin Green. Um, I'll be completely transparent. I, um, my 20s were not full of self-love. It was very destructive. It was very, you know, fiery and just kind of destroying things in my path, including myself. And, you know, now that I'm more um, mature now, I'm able to look back and see that that was in place for a reason, to protect, to keep, you know, people distance, to, there's always a self-serving thing. So, you know, just be honest with yourself throughout this process in order to get true clarity. Um, You know, in the twenties, I couldn't admit that I was those things, but I feel like if I were quicker to do so, I could have been quicker to heal and start this journey. So 
just really starting this with being patient with yourself, knowing that there's no right or wrong place to be as far as self-love, whether it's we're just exploring it, we lost ourselves in the way, or we're the biggest component and advocate for self-love. There's no wrong pace to be here. You know, just be open and be present as much as possible. So I'm going to have six steps tonight as we wrap up here. They're going to seem pretty lengthy and I'm going to take a lot of pauses where we feel the need to do so to journal and reflect. Um, but just bear with me here. Um, the first step is you be willing to feel pain and take responsibility for your feelings. So just like I was saying, it's okay to be heartbroken. It's okay to be discouraged. It's okay to have a lot of negative thoughts and feelings. Um, you want to be able to feel it. You first need to understand that all of our feelings are messages to ourselves that contain vital information. When people come in, I have depression, I have anxiety. The first thing I say is, what's your relationship with that depression? What's your relationship with that anxiety? What is it trying to tell you? Because we want to suppress and heal and put band-aids and medicaid and use substances and party and use relationships when really all we need to do is turn towards that. So this step is designed to help you open yourself up to what you're feeling and what they're trying to tell you. Hey, I'm anxious because I really got hurt in this past relationship. And now, you know, I'm on Tinder and swiping. And when they say hello, I get, oh, because I don't know if that's going to happen again. That's more acceptable. Oh, I'm anxious and I have social anxiety and I don't want to date. Let's get real and let's get real intentional of what we're experiencing. Um, this is an excellent place to practice mindful self-compassion since it will help you to get present in your body, open yourself up to feeling, and meet them with compassion. We can't be compassionate towards ourselves. We can't self-care, self-love, all these buzzwords without facing those really ugly and icky emotions and meeting them with compassion. This step is all about moving towards your feelings, even the difficult ones, rather than moving away from pain. So a lot of people hate working with me because we will sit with that pain until it reveals itself and its purpose. I'm not a, what they call toxic positivity therapist where, you know, all rainbows and, you know, we're good. No, let's sit with the icky stuff. So for two minutes, I'm going to invite us to do that here. You know, there's a reason why you signed up for this workshop. Um, of course, we want positive intentions and things, but for a moment, just kind of write out or reflect on or jot down in your iPhone, whatever, Android. What icky feelings and thoughts are you coming in with today? Are nearing at the end of this workshop. Hopefully they're not much. Hopefully you had a good time and you're feeling good. But if anything's still dwelling, just kind of jot that down. And I'll, I'll start in mine. I'm feeling so that y'all could be comfortable with doing it. I'm feeling anxious. I want to do a good job. I want to leave an impression for folks that took out the time and energy to be here. You know, and I'm not like saying I'm anxious. I'm like, I'm just very compassionate. Hey, that happens. This is understandable. It's part of the process of giving presentations. So really, that's the self-compassion part I like to see with the icky feelings. So now that you've hopefully written some stuff down, Step two, we're going to move into that feeling with the intent to learn. We want to learn from our feelings. People underestimate the strength and power of their own inner healer wisdom and intelligence. It's possessed with us, y'all. It's our birthright. So as we're in this inner bonding process, there's two intentions you can possibly have at any given moment. Either you want to protect against the pain or you want to learn more about the pain. Nine times out of 10, we're protecting. We're defense mechanisms, we're auto-responding, we're involuntarily you know, feeding into the loops and the narratives. If that's where we're at today, honor it. But we really wanna work towards step two, so let me tell more. So step one, you either want to protect against pain, avoid responsibility for it, use harmful behaviors like addictions and attempts to control, um, in order to, to avoid it, which a lot of people operate on that step. It's no right or wrong thing. Or you learn about what you're doing or thinking that may be causing you pain so you can take loving action on your own behalf. 
I went out with this um, certain type of assholes like once or twice or three times. Um, I really want to learn about why I'm willing to do it a fourth or fifth. That means awareness of those who joined me in the conscious cup uncoupling earlier. That brings consciousness into your behavior. The minute, the minute you do that is the minute you start to disidentify with that whole process. So it can be tough to move out of intention one, but moving to intention two is the only way for us to make progress and begin to love ourselves. It's the only way. You could, you could CBT, DBT, therapy it out all you want, but until you have that in mind, then it's just going to be harder. It's another band-aid that's not getting to the root of it. We must consciously choose to learn about ourselves, open up ourselves up to our higher self rather than wallowing in lower self. And higher self, lower self may be a bit woo-woo from what I like to say bluntly, high self-worth, low self-worth. That tends to trigger and, oh, wake people up and not many wanna, people want to admit they're operating out of low self-worth. But again, if we're being open and honest and getting down to it, that's what a lot of people tend to be doing. So, you know, getting in the habit of saying, okay, is this bringing me towards higher self or lower self, higher self or lower self worth? And this is all about loving yourself is discovering self, you know, dating yourself. Um, what is Devin like? What makes Devin feel good? What, 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 what kind of behaviors kind of signal that Devin's offer? This is how you do it. It sounds crazy, but it's the only way to make intentional progress and transformation. So um, this next try, just kind of journal. Are you kind of default operating off of step one, protecting against pain? Are, are you truly genuinely making the strides and steps to, you know, step two, learn more about what you're doing, discovering self, being curious about yourself and your behaviors? The fact that you're all here is kind of leaning more towards step two, but just be honest so that we can know where to go from there. I'll pause just to let y'all reflect on that. And even further, is it a, if it is step one, what are you protecting yourself against? We gotta know these things. So learn step three is learning about your false beliefs, narratives, scripts, loops stories. They're all the same thing serving the same purpose. You want to learn about them. Where did they originate? When I hear it, is it really my voice or is it mom's voice, dad's voice, ex's voice, traumatic person who's traumatized me voice? False beliefs, unfortunately, we all have them. In the process of learning to love ourselves, it is vital that we identify our false beliefs. Session one with me, we're listing them all out. That's that's part of the work is, is, is naming them, acknowledging them, finding their origin spot, and then um, transferring them to some alternatives. But in order to do it, I, I'm saying it like it's easy. I, I promise it's not. It involves a deep and compassionate process of exploration, probing your inner self about the beliefs and values at your core and connecting your beliefs to a person or situation that is causing you pain. And I kid you not, every time I ask, okay, what's the source, what's the origin? You would think is hmm, uh, almost always they're able to directly go there. Maybe unconsciously in your day-to-day, -day, you think you don't know, but once poked and prompted and probed, always, oh, you know what? Yeah, my dad said, you know, I wouldn't amount to anything. So no wonder why when this job opportunity came up, I didn't go for it. Oh, that makes sense. There's always a source and it's easier to get there than you think. Again, you just have to turn out awareness that takes down all the defenses and all the layers that are protecting you and exposing you to truth. You can conduct this exploration by asking yourself, what am I thinking or doing that's causing these painful feelings? What's causing anxiety? What's causing depression? What's causing guilt or shame, jealousy, anger, loneliness, or emptiness? Allow the answer to come for your inner, authentic, 
high worth self directly from the source of your feelings. So we're gonna pause here. I'm gonna spend a little bit of more time. I'm gonna put music on and everything because I really want you to recognize your own false beliefs. Whether this is the first time you've heard of this term or you think you've been aware of them for however long you've been dealing with it, but you'd be surprised day to day, some new ones could pop up depending on the situation, depending on the triggers, depending on what you learned today in this you know, seminar, maybe some other things kind of popped up or you found yourself saying, oh, I can't play. I can't do that. I can't do conscious uncoupling. So I'm going to spend a few minutes here just to explore what you're thinking or doing that's causing you pain. What's causing you suffering? And be honest about it. Be honest about it is all I can say. And I'll leave this prompt up for like a minute or two. Okay, so now that we have our false beliefs, at least within, within our awareness, or at least, you know, in our conscious, you know, there, when you have a handle on what you are thinking or doing that is causing these feelings, explore your wounded ego. Explore your wounded ego. So for those who, um, about me, I'm very much um, spirituality based. So a lot of my approaches consciousness awareness obviously um things of that nature and a lot has to do with the ego so i'll do a brief introduction to that your ego is your self that you present to yourself and especially others so my ego of therapist my ego of being a queer black woman my ego of you know all these things that kind of got built through external forces, but are not my true innate, even though I am those things and feel in alignment with them. You know, if I'm, I'm really a lover. I'm really an advocate for these things. They, but my passionate and worth things are a little bit different. But the ego is kind of what you want the world to see. And it, it's usually a mask that you have to put on. It's usually not your authentic self that's loved and, you know, and the tricky thing about the ego is that it does a lot of protecting. In a in a in a, in one end, it's good that it's it's protecting you from pain and sorrow and suffering, but on the other hand, that's really really um, dangerous, because once these true things start getting in, then we're in a shift, and we're in an identity crisis, or we're disassociating, or we're disconnected from self. And it's scary and it's unfamiliar. So, oops, let me go back to this facade because I find comfort and strength in it. So when I say explore your wounded ego, it's simply just asking when we talk about false beliefs and the source of anxiety and depression and, you know, rooting all this trauma. What does the ego do? Where does it retreat to? This is the only way we can identify the fears and false beliefs we have that lead us to self-abandoning thoughts and actions, self-sabotaging, ruining opportunities for ourselves, um, speaking negatively over our lives and the lives of others. That's how the one video. I think I mentioned before, once you take something, you replace it with something else. And we don't readily have those higher self, higher self, we're ready to go. So we result to some negative things and some behaviors and tendencies. Identifying your false beliefs is a vital step towards challenging these beliefs, accepting yourself and loving yourself. So this stuff has steps involved in it, but you wanna identify your false beliefs and once you identify them, it's it's tearing a wall down. And that wall is used to protect the ego. So instead of letting the ego be wounded and negative and self-sabotaging and all those things that lead to further pain and suffering for you, because that's, again, the cycle that it knows and wants to stay in, in rhythm with, what are you replacing it with? 
what false beliefs are turning into truths? What 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 like loops and narratives of negativity that are turning into you speaking power in life over yourself and your relationships and your career and your finances and all those things. So again, always the laws of the universe you take away, you have to replace with something and immediately. We're used to our pattern and rhythms. They're comfortable. Even if they're toxic, we'd rather go back to what we know and what brings us security. But this stability and security and self-love that we're talking about today, it has to be revealed. It has to be revamped. And in order to do all that, we first have to learn about what's keeping us small, what's keeping us in low self-worth. So once you do all those things, I mean, we did a lot. We've we recognize those icky feelings that we're trying to avoid and we unearth kind of the, you know, limited self-beliefs that may be developed in, in, in spite of it. We've, you know, let the ego of the guard down, which typically operates on low self-worth and vibration. And it's nothing wrong. And again, the ego, and again, is how we present ourselves and it's not always a negative thing, but it's not always within our true higher worth, higher self, authentic self either. So that could be tricky within itself, but um, I'm calling that side of you forward. When, when someone asks, oh, tell me about yourself, what do you do? And you do that long laundry list of that scripted thing that you tell everybody, that's not higher self. I'm not speaking to that. But when you feel joy and you feel seen and heard and whatever's going on, whatever you're doing, who's ever around you, that's higher self, that's higher self-worth. And that's who we're going to have a dialogue with in step four. Um, so step four, you must open yourself up to loving yourself before any answers will come, but they will come eventually. They may not come right now in this seminar. They may not come within two months of therapy. They may not come even in two years. There is a time and a place for everything. Just know that they're coming. The ego can't, you know, keep the true self contained for, for much longer. Even being here and just being introduced is planting seeds. It's planting seeds, it's leaving residue. You know, it's, it's, it's whether we know it or not, even if you're not paying full attention, it's it's bubbling something within. So be patient with yourself in this journey because that's part of the work. Um, but it may take only minutes for you to make important connections and discover new understandings of yourself. For 30 minutes in, you're probably already making the connections of and hopefully discovering new, new process and things about you. Um, and again, it may take days, weeks, or even months. These insights may only come in images in your mind or they may show up in your dreams. I tell clients keep a dream journal, especially when we unpack stuff like this. Because you may think, oh, none of this is landing, none of this is hitting. And then go to sleep at night where the unconscious is revealed and wake up with so many, I have visions of me, you know, doing, doing the limitless. I have visions of me doing things I never did before. I have visions of me being CEO. You'd be surprised at what's getting through to you there. Um, however they show up, know that they will show up if your heart is open to them. It's only a matter of time. So already, just sit here, close your eyes, ground yourself to the earth. Become aware of everything around you, the sound of my voice, your body on the chair. Really just be still in this moment. And call upon your higher self, your higher worth self, your savage self, whatever it looks like, whatever it's going to be, your, your <laughs> call on that person and just see what comes. See what images, see what thoughts, see what, and just sit here for a moment and, and let's see what reveals itself. So hopefully something comes to you. If not, it's okay. 
But I want to just say, remember how we started off with that list of our person? Did that higher self meet the expectations of that list? Are you what you're looking for? You may be everything of which you seek. You just got to be still enough and aware enough and conscious enough to introduce and discover that part of self. You know, I, it's important for me to be alone to just check in and make sure that I enjoy my own company when I'm alone. You know, you can't fulfill relationships with work, with, you know, those IG worthy posts of just traveling and being like nothing can compare to being in the presence of your own company and finding stillness and peace and love and self-compassion in that. So hopefully the higher self, higher worth self revealed itself again. If not today, it's okay. Seeds are being planted. They will reveal themselves when the time is right for you. Um, but until then, always know that that's a mission. You know, when you're looking for partnership or you're dating or you're looking for something else, resort, but admit that be your first go-to as opposed to filling with those other things. So step five, you want to take the loving action learning in step four. That whole stillness, that moment, even if you sat and closed your eyes for three seconds, that was three seconds of you trying to find higher self. That was three seconds of you trying to connect and be self-compassionate and have self-love towards self. Now that compared to maybe you're struggling with intrusive, negative self-talk constantly. Maybe you're struggling with, again, those limiting beliefs that were Echoes a mom saying, I'm not good enough. Echoes a dad saying, I'll never be loved. Whatever the case may be. Three seconds, two seconds, one second is better than nothing of you being exposed to, okay, I'm at least shifting. I'm at least trying or attempting to be in another energetic level or frequency or whatever you want to call it. So take the insights you gain in step four when calling on your higher self and apply them to your life. If you saw higher self in front of a boardroom as in a CEO chair, let me apply that to life. What do I need to do to get there? Do I need to stop taking on jobs that are not at low pay and low value of what my skill set is and what I have to offer? Um, was that vision of higher self you with kids running to you and a family and the white picket fence thing, you know, and you being loved appropriately? That means the steps I need to apply today is stop dating certain type of individuals who aren't on that on that intention or stop settle, you know, being in relationships where my needs are suppressed or I cannot express myself adequately. Apply them to your life today. <laughs> you know, not next week, not tomorrow, like actually sit here and write down these action steps is, is what we need to do. Um, did you notice that your stress or depression or anxiety often rise because you don't tend to your own needs? Make sure to tend to your needs. Um, I, well, I, I work with a lot of people pleasers and the, a little activity I like to do is one time a day, express your needs. I don't care how little, it could be the people at Starbucks didn't act didn't add a whip and you ask for extra whip respectfully and, and gently you don't have to be a viewer but hey actually I'm sorry I asked for not even I'm sorry like hey I asked for extra whip thank you so much if you could do that for me one time a day one little thing I don't care how small get used to making your needs met or get used to at least putting your yourself in a position to get them met they may not be fulfilled. They may still get your order wrong. They may still not listen to you or whatever, but at least, at least you're getting into the practice of exercising your right to ask for, for what you need. So, you know, that of course is going to lead to higher self or higher self, things that you need to do immediately. That's an action step. Did you discover that you often assign the worst possible opinions about yourself to others, even when they haven't signaled any such opinions? People are mirrors. We talked about conscious uncoupling relationships are the best. 
any annoying thing that your partner is doing is probably something that you do that you can accept within yourself. And you need to give love and compassion towards yourself. And it's crazy how it shows up. There's some characters in movies or shows I watch. And I'm like, ugh, I don't know why, but this person makes me cringe and really irks me. That's just tickle me to be like, okay, wait. In what ways do I embody that in my life and that I need to pour love into? And I can tell you right now, full disclosures, um, the people that make me feel like that when I watch something are the ones who are very submissive and that are letting people walk over them. I'm like, ugh. And then I check in and say, okay, these are ways that I'm like that within myself. And these are what I'm going to do to show more compassion towards that part of self. Stop yourself when you head in this direction and remind yourself that you can't know what others are thinking. Assuming the worst is usually both wrong and unhelpful. So in the same breath, like, compassion towards self is compassion towards others. You don't know what people are thinking. You don't know what people are going through. And the way you treat people is often a reflection of how you're treating yourself. You see it all the time, like, oh, that person is, is not so great. I can tell that they're struggling with something within or I could tell they need to do some work within. If you're struggling with this stuff, remember that asking, what can I do to love myself better? A simple yet potent question. It doesn't have to be six steps and a whole seminar of no, I'm glad y'all are here. At the end of the day, I would just ask, what can I do for myself tomorrow to love myself more? Or what did I do today that was acting outside of that intention? is a far better question than how can I feel love for myself? It's much harder to conjure a desired feeling out of thin air than it is to take actions that will help you authentically experience a desired feeling. There's actions and there's intentions. I'm very much action-based. I'm very much solution-focused. I'm not the traditional talk therapist where we vent over and over, like, okay, what are we gonna do about it? Okay, what steps are you gonna take? Okay, how are you going to love yourself more this week? Okay, how did you not show up for yourself and express your needs this week? How can we fix that? That's kind of the energy that you have to bring for yourself. Nobody's going to bring it for you. Maybe the therapist will, maybe a good partnership and community and support will, but there's no one like yourself that will answer that question better and that can ask that question better. So really having that loving action not just intention, action as well. And then the last and most final step is evaluating that action. Anytime I assign that to clients, the first thing I do when I meet them again is, okay, let's assess how, how you think you did with that. Did you BS? Did you really go all out? Did you, okay, my therapist checked, I did it you know, are, were we really into it? Check in with yourself after step five and every step that came with step five. Did the loving action you took help you shed some of your anger and shame? Again, full circle, we're, we're doing all of this to help, you know, nurture those negative feelings and those icky things. You know, more self-compassion, more love, more self-worth, higher self. Did that help diminish some of the anger or shame or is it still there? We don't know. We got to see. Did it soothe your pain and help you be more compassionate towards yourself? If not, repeat these steps. Don't just try it once. Oh, nothing got soothed. Nothing got resolved. That didn't work. It takes time. These limiting beliefs and icky feelings were built decades and years and years and years. It's going to take more than one Self-care, love, workshop, and like five, six-step plan in order to promote change. Repeat these steps as needed, as needed until you have found the correct ingredients and steps that will lead you to peace, joy, and a sense of intrinsic self-worth. The steps are there. You just have to play with them and see what they are. Okay, advocating for myself and being a people pleaser didn't really hit that hard. You know, maybe I should... Um, say yes more, go on more dates, you know, let more people in, do a little bit of exposure therapy to see what I could, you know, what I could call in for myself. Um, you know, if kind of 
having that psychoeducation piece for a partner and trying to illuminate them on what you need and what is right and that doesn't work, okay, I'm gonna educate myself on this. How can I provide this for myself? I can't count on anyone to do this, it seems like, so let me do it for myself. So repeat the steps until something else happens. Evaluate, evaluate. A lot of people do the steps without circling back to see if they even worked. This process will not only help you to love yourself, it will also affect every area of your life. When you show yourself love and compassion, your relationships, your work, your friendship, your support, your family, your entire reality will reflect this positive energy. And again, not to get too woo-woo, but you get what you put in. If you're putting in negativity, anxiety, depression, of course, your reality is going to reflect that. If you put in more self-compassion, self-love, patience, joy, care, gratitude, it's all going to return back. So really, really taking the time to evaluate the action. Set time out of each day, an hour before bed, every an hour before work in the morning. Whatever you need to do, this needs to become your new rhythm to the point that it, it's louder than the negative beliefs and self-talk, to the point that it's louder than the negative trauma and the low self-worth that you've been operating out of. This is a dramatic shift. You have to make dramatic changes to get there. So for the last few moments, I am, I know I keep saying it, but I'm really legit going to put some music on. I want you to take, write down three steps that you're going to take to invite more self-compassion and love and challenging of limiting beliefs for yourself. And then a plan on how you want to evaluate checking in with therapists, journaling every night or every morning, meditating, you know, taking walks on the beach where I could just kind of process and evaluate how I did. Um, so I'm going to take literally, I'll put it um, five minutes to, for you to want to make those three action steps and your way to evaluate it. Um, if anyone wants to share their action steps or get some advice on how to critique that and tailor it to more like authentic work. Like I don't want to just like, let's get really intentional here. Um, feel free to drop it in the Q&A, raise your hand, get off mute, whatever you want to do. Um, and we could kind of collaborate and tailor that specifically for you together. Okay. So some of mine, like for example, um, I really feel loved most when I feel understood, seen, and heard. And as Cliche as that may sound, like that is so important to me. I surround myself with relationships and work and like everything in my life, that theme is, is constant. And if ever that's not the case, I'm quick to retreat and, you know, have that anxious fight or flight response where I'm out and, you know, um, which kind of speaks to those limiting beliefs of you know, you're too much or you can't ask for that. You're inadequate because you are needing certain things. And, and that's all you guys kind of have to stop to say. So an action step that I kind of develop around that is I will express myself and be very clear and, and intentional with that communication. So it's not just, oh, I want to be feel, I want to be seen and heard. It's I want to be seen and here's how. You know, when I'm speaking or I'm getting excited about things, I would like follow-up questions. I would like feedback. Um, I want to feel heard and this is how. You know, when I'm speaking, I need the social cues that you're engaged. You're not on your phone. You're not distracted. So this is what I'm talking about. Action steps that actually come with very clear and intentional expectations for not only for you to be able to better monitor, but for people to actually show up and, and, and comply with. You know, it's not always that, oh, I'm so misunderstood, I'm, on, I'm not heard, I'm not seen, even though that may be the true reality for people. I ask, okay, but what have you done to make it clear that this needs to be in place to be seen and heard and felt? So that's like one of my action steps. Each, um, the way I monitor that, like we said, to kind of assess to see after any interaction, and I mean, work meeting, talks with my partners, um, getting off the phone with family, I check in and say, okay, you know, how did you feel in, the, in those moments? Did that checklist of seeing, heard, and felt get completed? 
If not, do you want to follow up and kind of say how you felt and where the disconnect was in there? If so, do you want to send them verbal praise and say, you know, I really appreciated our conversation today, sending that email, and really enjoyed the meeting and the, the creative expression we formulated together. You know, you really just want to have that evaluation piece to do it. Um, so I'm trying to see, is there any more questions or anything around action steps if you're comfortable with sharing? Mm, okay, Erin, let's see, thank you. So I asked why I feel the need to block someone that I'm catching myself looking for his replies. Okay, that's a big one. That's a big one. Um, it was really back in that 20s era where I told you earlier, if you looked at my block contact list, it was literally scrolling and scrolling and it was ridiculous. And I even had to ask myself too, like, why do I feel the need to block them? In what ways is that communicating that they have power, that they have power that I need to take back by blocking them? That was my belief. They have the power. I need to block them to not give that that power. Um, so that is a really good indicator that you need to have compassion towards. What part of myself, Aaron, am I blocking? Or what am I, What part of Aaron is trying to be protected and trying to block these people? Avoidance attachment. What am I trying to avoid? In what ways have I attached unhealthily that is setting the tone for you know wanting to avoid attachment now? And how can I replace that with something more healthy? Loving attachment, compassionate attachment, um, you know, intentional attachment. But again, it all starts with how you attach with yourself. It's easier to avoid others and put up blocks and put up walls. And again, protect that ego of not being hurt and being savage or whatever, you know, you may be experiencing in order to not get hurt. You know, all of that's understandable. And this is why those feelings are there for a reason. But once we're, until we're more honest with those reasons, you know, I block people because I, I don't want to get hurt again. I don't want to be exposed to the, the madness that is dating in, in our current society. I don't want to, you know, have to look for his replies and maybe they don't reply and then I feel like shit because they didn't. You know, all of that is there to serve you for a reason. It just says, you know what, I appreciate that, you know, but I'm going to move into something more healthy. I'm going to, I'm not going to block them unless it's something, you know, where they need blocking, you know, but I'm not going to block them. I'm also not going to look for their reply. Instead of checking the phone, looking for that, hoping for that, I'm going to turn that energy inward. I'm going to love stuff. I'm going to shower self. I'm going to do something, you know, those action steps where that'll bring me closer to higher self-worth. I'm not going to do that. And then hopefully avoidance attachment will turn to loving attachment and not with others, at least with yourself. Like, wow, I really love myself enough to not block and not fall into those patterns and those limiting beliefs you know, next, and maybe that could be your action step. Next time, don't block them and have that go-to response. Instead, I'm going to go take a little milk bath. I'm going to do a face mask. I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to do a run. And, you know, then evaluating that response. You know what? That felt pretty good. Now I'm not looking for responses. Now I'm not like checking the block list. I'm just authentically true to self and pouring that all into me. So that's a big one, Aaron, that people face and even I'm guilty of doing. Um, but yeah, just being very really curious about that. What does blocking symbolize? What power do they possess that I'm trying to regain? And how can I bring that back to source to self? So uh, yeah, saying block this long because feeling my power is with him. Mm -mm. Don't give him that power. It's been abusers and healthier people were scary because of these yeah. And that's all great insight. But don't just let it be that. Again, work with therapists, work with um, journaling and whatever feels good to you and really tackle these things. You know, you know what? The healthier people, who are they? <laughs> and and how, how is that healthier person being embodied within you? And how can you love that part of self and form relationship with that 
instead of going, we know where it's going to go with the same type of people. So I know toxic people comes safety and not being rejected and familiar, but it never works out. So although you think in short term it's working for you and it's being fulfilling, in the long run, it's only a band-aid. So really good, Aaron. Um, really good, Aaron. Really good insight, Aaron. Continue to use that. Continue to pour life and water it, just like plants that have died, you know. Give love and self-compassion to that aspect of self. Keep being real like you are in this chat. And pretty soon the higher self-worth self will present itself because it can't keep up that facade any longer. You can't exist in low and high self-worth. You just can't. So eventually it'll come through and I am really excited for that for you. How can you give love to that part of yourself better? Asking it what it needs. Like today when we sit and we meditate and we call on that higher self, spend time with it, date it. What is, you know, he, she, they like? In just as much time and energy you would spend in pursuing someone else, getting to know them, what do you like to do? What do you do? Ask that for yourself. What does Aaron really like to do? What brings Aaron joy? What brings her peace? At the end of the day, when she's fulfilled and happy and, and satisfied, what, what was necessary in order to make that happen? Bring it all back to self. Bring it all back to self and being gentle with yourself too. You know, cognitively, emotionally, physically, um, you know, self-love, self-hugging, touch, self-pleasure. Hell, this is pineapple after all. I mean, whatever you need to do, you got to do it. And of course, making that intentional space and time and energy to do so. Without it, we're just continuing to be victims to loops and beliefs and narratives that are no longer serving us. And for sure, not bringing us to higher self and self-worth. So really good question. You just asking it alone is, believe it or not, taking a step in towards that direction. When is the last time, maybe the first time you've asked yourself, how can I love myself better? How can I give more love to those parts of myself? Just you asking mm -hmm. is more powerful than you think. So I, I love that. I invite everyone else to ask that too. All right. Was there anything else from anyone? It was a lot, but I hope you keep those prompts. I hope, you know, if, if any, if everything else got overwhelming, the one takeaway is just exposing yourself to those limiting beliefs and taking appropriate steps each day to challenge them. Yeah. That alone will bring you more towards self-love and self-compassion um, and at least starting to disidentifying with the old ways of operating. All right. If there's nothing else again, um, I'm Devin Deshay. You could find me at D E V I N D S H A E on Instagram. Um, I'm very nice on there. <laughs> I love people and talking. So, um, you know, don't be too in intimidated to, to find me there. I will be hosting an Ask a Sexologist Q and A hour on IG Live tomorrow at 5 p.m. Um, Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, I love pineapple support. I love the work that I do here and the people that I serve. So you can always find me through here. Um, looking uh, through the ther therapist directory, control F to find Devin. And there I will be. Um, yeah, so if you're looking for things around self-love and compassion, I specialize in that, empowering especially those in the industry. If you're looking again for relationships, conscious uncoupling, anything around sexuality, um, I could be the go-to for that as well. Um, but again, thank you all for joining this self-love, stability, and security workshop. Please don't let this just be concepts that come and go or that you jot down and never revisit. Set a reminder to circle back to this set a reminder to get with the therapist and say, I learned these really cool things here. Keep me accountable for them. Um, just always return back to it. 
Maybe it's also on other than books outside and put, yeah, and the books, you know, whatever your jam is, books can be illuminating podcasts, webinars for one are my ways of educating and being educated. So again, I'm really glad that all y'all are here today. Hope you take away something that changes your life completely. Thank you so much, Devin. Absolutely. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you very, very much. And hopefully we will have you on another event very soon. Absolutely. Take care. No. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you everyone who has stuck with us for the event, Safety, Stability and Self-Love. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you to our sponsors, Sex Panther, Sexy Jobs and Strip Chat. For anyone who would like to get more involved with Pineapple Support, please do visit the website. There is a button at the top there that says get involved. You can become a volunteer listener. You can join Pineapples United. You can donate. You can reach out if you want to become an ambassador. We're always looking for people that want to be active and, and work with Pineapple Support to help, help promote our resources and get involved in, um, in activities, particularly when we go to, to conferences and shows um we're so so grateful for all of you and and thank you very very much and i hope to see you all soon bye for now